Good evening. Good evening and uh, welcome. My name is Peter McDonald. Um, I'm a professional beekeeper from Castlemaine and hosting the panel for this evening. So my plan for the panel this evening, we've got an eminent group of people here that can talk underwater when they get on the topics. So my plan for this evening is to not talk much and let them uh, do the show. So this year has been very exciting, this past year for us. Um, just over 12 months ago, Varroa was detected uh, in surveillance hives near the port of Newcastle. A lot's happened since then. 12 months on from that, we're in a very lucky place here in Victoria. We've got Varroa is still constrained to an area up around Newcastle. I should put my um, next slide up because we are not talking about um, elephants. Um, we're talking about this little thing here. Um, and I'll also go to the next slide. And, and this is the people we have here on the panel that is talking tonight. But as I said, we're very, in a very lucky position here. Um, we can still operate fairly normal. Um, basically, is with a few extra conditions, we're just doing our normal thing, business as usual almost. Um, and we're also very lucky because 12 months on, um, Varroa is still constrained and we've got a group of people here that know the situation back the front and know Varroa back the front. So take the opportunity tonight and the rest of the conference while they're here, ask questions tonight. Uh, confront them and whenever they're trying to go and get a cup of tea or a meal or anything like that or just sidle up next to them and ask them questions, burning questions. But in, this goes for tonight as well. Be respectful. Um, they're, they're doing a great job. They're doing a job that we as an industry have asked them to do for us and that is to protect Australia from Varroa. And that's an important role. We as an industry agreed to go down the way we're going, to constrain Varroa and try to eradicate it if possible. And so that's what these people are doing here for us. Maybe not Jason, but, uh, but uh, he's got the different perspective and he knows Varroa inside out. Um, so yes, so what we'll do tonight, um, each speaker will get up and, and take in turns and we'll talk to you about their chosen subject, Varroa, and, uh, and their experiences, their particular experiences. Um, I would recommend, but it's up to you and it's up to the individual speaker, that you sort of note down your questions and ask the questions later. Each, each speaker will, will talk um, and then we will open up for just, we'll just have a free for all with questions with anything that's cropped up. There's a lot of information to, to get through to you and, uh, yeah, and, and everyone's got a lot of questions. Uh, as I said before, be respectful in your questions, be polite. Um, these people are doing a hell of a good job. Uh, but also we've got um, some of the people on the panel here um, had been directly affected by the response and lost their beehives up in the red zone. And that's another reason why we're very lucky. We've still got all our bees. You know, we're, we're still going. We've had floods and all sorts of stuff down here as well, but we haven't lost it to Varroa. So just be careful. Um, those wounds uh, can be fresh still. So. Be respectful in the way we, we talk to each other. Um, so first of all, we'll get, uh, well, to, to introduce the speakers, um, we've got Daniel Lefer, who you know, the CEO of Arbic. Um, and Danny's been involved with the response from day one and knows it inside out, and especially from the, the upper levels, the decision making and the control of the whole response. Um, Bianca, the Arbic Varroa coordinator, again, involved from day one, an affected beekeeper and directly involved on the ground in the response um, with New South Wales DPI. Um, Jason, as he's already said, he knows Varroa inside and out and can have great insights as to, and looking, from New, looking at our situation from New Zealand, he knows what he's doing with Varroa, but then also will have some insights for us about how we're going. Um, Nikki, Nikki Jones um, with uh, Ag Victoria. So Nikki's in charge of our B team within Ag Victoria, and she's helping prepare Victoria in the event that Varroa does, does get free. And then also conducting a lot of surveillance and to, to actually prove that Varroa is free as well. And lastly, Liz Frost, again, involved from day one, um, directly affected, lost bees, um, but also in, in the response with New South Wales DPI, and also directly affected by managing our 
bee breeding program, the National Bee, bee, bee Breeding Program, and, uh, and yes, and the effect that Varroa has had on that. So we've got a great range of experiences. Take advantage of it and um, listen in, and uh, I'll just hand over to Danny and, and he can start things off. So uh, as Pete said, I'm Daniel Lefebvre. I work for the, for the Australian Honeybee Industry Council. What we thought we might do tonight is, is we've got just a handful of slides that I'll put up. It'll give you a bit of a sit rep of the Varroa response where it's standing at the moment. Um, and also talk about the impacts that we're seeing uh, in other countries, New Zealand and the US. Just a, a bit of thought provoking question starting sort of discussion. Um, That's not, I've lost all the. Ah, here we go. Going the wrong way. Okay, so a bit of a sit rep of where we are. So we are on day 379 today, and it feels like 379 years, not days. Um, and probably put that many years on my life as well. Um, at the moment, as we stand currently today, there's 183 infested properties um, across the red zones. To date, the DPI themselves have done surveillance, which is opening the hives, putting mainly doing mats and strips, strips in there, sticky mats underneath, coming in, pulling that out two or three days later, taking the mat to a lab. There's a pair of eyeballs down a microscope who looks at every single mat, declares it um, mite-free or otherwise. And they've done that across 44,500 hives across the red zones. So it's been, a, you can just imagine how big a job that is. Um, to date, there's been 242 commercial beekeepers affected in those zones. Um, nearly 4,000 recreational beekeepers now caught up in it as well. There's been nearly 26,000 hives euthanized across the red zones. And in fact, the red zones have just gone over 1,000 square kilometres across the red as well. Um, to date, there's, there's over 700 bait stations across the red zones putting out fipronil baits to try and control the feral bee population. Every day on the ground, there's between 180 and 200 staff working in this response. Um, sometimes they get a Saturday and Sunday off, but a lot of times they work on Saturday. Um, during the response, we've had 300 volunteer beekeepers um, from uh, multiple states uh, working there. There'll be people in the room here, I'd imagine, that, are, that are volunteered as well. And whenever I do this, one of the first questions I get is, what is the biggest risk for this response is people physically moving right out of the zones. So what, what's happening around that? So to date, there's been over 70 compliance investigations done. And about half of those have resulted in either fines, notices, even some court action. And they are following up on that as well. This is the current map, and I just wanted to talk a bit to this because just over the last couple of days, the astute people in the audience that are following closely would note that there's been a couple of new detections. So up in this area, up the top on the northern side, those that can't see, um, there's been a couple of new detections in this area that's really filled out the red zones. That is concerning for the response because that is getting into some very heavily timbered areas. Um, they're doing work madly at the moment trying to trace to find out whether that's natural spread or hive movements. They're reasonably confident it's to do with equipment moving. Um, but it is a big concern. And perhaps even more so, about a, a couple of weeks ago we had a detection at a place called St Albans. St Albans is heading right into the Woolamai National Park, Heritage Vista National Park. Incredibly steep terrain, inaccessible to be able to get in there and really get a good handle on feral bees and that sort of stuff. So huge risk. We're very confident now with St Albans that it was a movement and, is, and they've done surveillance in and around that zone and haven't found any more. However, just a couple of days ago, five kilometres south of that St Albans one, they found another detection another IP. It's on the same road as the same open space. And so they're doing again, madly trying to trace it, um, but they're, they're confident um, that it is again movement, but they haven't 
finished doing all the work they've got to do around that. So it is slowly getting bigger. Um, this is the biggest plant pest response that Australia's ever embarked on. Um, and so it isn't the way through. So I thought I'd also just put a couple of slides up. Um, thought provoking to thought -provoking inspire some questions. Inspire some questions. This, is this is the US uh, colony loss uh, data colony from the Bee Informed group. group. Just updated it actually uh, last week actually um, with the 2022-23 data, which has gone up. So now 48% colony losses last year throughout the year. That's both summer and winter it's overall losses. The same beekeepers, they do that in a survey. The same beekeepers when they survey, they're saying, about 60 percent of those beekeepers have said that varroa is the number one cause for their colony loss queen um, survivability and succession of the queen issues is the second cause and there's a bunch of them under that in starvation it's not i'm not putting it up there to try and scare the hands off you but what i'm trying to say is that if we don't put an effort in to try and control varroa the way we keep bees will change forever. In the US, it's really about just splitting the eyes and keeping the numbers up. The same story, but not as dramatic as I've been told in, in New Zealand. So New Zealand also have a, a program called Coal Loss, uh, which is a survey-based system um, where they capture about 90% of all the commercial hives that are out there in the survey. They started in 2015, um, which was 15 years, 15 years after they, they discovered might say, and they've seen a, a trend of steadily increasing of colony loss up until last year, where it's plateaued. When they surveyed their beekeepers, the number one reason for that is, is also varroa. Queens, again, the second reason for their colony losses over the year. The varroa losses, what is important when you look at this, this graph is the varroa colony, well, the losses due to varroa has steadily increased and even more so in the last few years. So they've now come up with a strategy um, to try and minimise those losses and they're really focused, focusing on the queen um, component of that because that is something they can, can control a lot better. This slide also, just to try and provoke a bit of thought, is a slide about the treatments they're using in New Zealand. Um, by the way, all this, uh, these slides that I've put up are all public documents. So MPI New Zealand have just published this data, Be Informed website for the, um, the US. But this is showing that, um, giving you some stats around not only the treatments people are using um, and the combination of treatments, but also the efficacy of those treatments. So how well they're working. Um, interestingly, I get continually told that acetic acid vaping is going to be the solution to all our problems. In the US, the data is suggesting it's giving them 62.9% efficacy with oxalic acid vaping. Um, they're still relying on synthetic treatments. And that's just what we heard this morning as well. Um, so I think we've, you know, there's a lot of learnings we need to do with Varroa if we are going to have to work with it. Um, and we're going to have to look at our colleagues over the ditch, unfortunately. I, I, was, I, was, I, was in, I was in New Zealand last week for four days and I copped the flogging the whole time from <laughs> about being Australian, so it's, it's my turn to get you back a bit. Um, uh, so we're going to have to lean on those guys and really learn from them. So I think that's all I've probably got to say. And, and I think we're going to go through each one now, and then we'll take questions at the end. So I'll leave the slide up there, though. Just bring that down to my height. Uh, so I'm Bianca Jiggins. Um, I'm the Varroa Coordinator for Arbic. Um, I was lucky enough to take the role on in January this year. Um, I previously have been a beekeeper for about 10 years. I did have a very small commercial business in Newcastle region. Um, where I had about 80 colonies and the last couple of years been working towards a couple of business goals as well as working full time and having a family. Um, when Varroa came last year, um, I was working at Tokau College as the training coordinator for the Honeybee program for the training. And 
Um, went in on the Saturday, um, went in for two weeks straight, went hard, got told to go home because I worked too hard, did too many hours, was going a bit loopy. Um, I am doing a talk tomorrow a little bit about what that involved and some images about it, but essentially we lost our bee business um, during the process of being part of the red zones very early on. Um, and then we eventually um, lost the hives for the education program at Tokal as well, swallowed up by the red zones. Um, part of our business plan was recently purchasing property and building a shed for a honey extraction plant. Um, we've tried really hard to progress our business as the years have gone on and put all our spare money, spare time, spare energy into building it up safe um, to run a better honey plant, to run a better tr truck. Um, all of those things are now on hold. Our home address is now Red Zone 2. So um, we did have a breeder queen. We've done all the courses at Tokal, obviously, um, being very connected in that area, very close to that, um, to that place where our home base is. So um, I guess without giving too much away about my, my talk tomorrow, that's, um, I've been in and out of the response um, from the start, but also um, kept working um, in my normal role at Tokal and then coming in and out of the response, doing surveillance, um, doing night shifts, doing euthanasias, um, meeting lots of amazing people um, who are all pretty dedicated to what they're doing. It's not fun work. You get abused, you get all sorts of things. You get thanked, but you also, you know, you're taking the good with the bad daily. Um, I w was lucky enough to come into Arvik in the start of the year and I've now been involved in the response ongoing every day. As uh, Steve mentioned earlier, we do go into the IMT meetings at, um, talking with the management program or the team of the response. Um, I'm fielding calls daily and doing meetings very often, multiple times a day with the response team and also with beekeepers that are affected in the red and purple zones and working towards, with Danny, working towards making the response um, effective for business continuity as well, which is involving talking to different state bodies and people like Nikki in Victoria about moving hives and all of the intricacies of keeping business continuity for the rest of the blue zone in New South Wales. So I think that's it. Um, that'll do me, I think. I'll wait for questions later. Thanks, Bianca. Um, Jason, do you want to say any more? And I won't, I won't say too much more, but um, I've done, done enough talking this morning already, but uh, I, I can, um, if anybody's got any questions on how we actually live with Ferrara in New Zealand, um, I'm more than happy to dig, dig right into that. Um, we have been managing it pretty successfully for quite a few years and growing our business and doing all the things that you guys do, pollination, honey production, queen raising and stuff like that. So keep the questions coming. Just before you go, Jason, I've got a quick question for you. Danny threw up some um, uh, stats about New Zealand and, and hive losses and stuff. Is, is that something that uh, that you see as well or at the same level as the national stats? Uh, yeah, I, I wondered if the, the last stat, the 2022 stat, was the year just been or was it the season before? Yes, yeah, so I think that's that's probably pretty close to what we're seeing. Yep. And is that what you're seeing? Like that's an as an industry. Is that what you're seeing within your operation? Um, not. We're not seeing big losses to Varroa in our operation, but we are seeing, um, as an industry, we've seen quite big losses over the last sort of two or three years. Um, I think when <coughs> when this season's losses come out they'll probably be higher than those two that you've got there. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jason. Well, um, some more questions for Jason a bit later. Um, Nikki. I won't stand too close. Um, hi, everyone. So this is the first time I've stood up in front of you guys as the now biosecurity manager for APRI, and I think my timing's impeccable, wouldn't you agree? Um, super, super stressful year to take on that role from Joe. Um, right as this all happened across the border. So I suppose um, 
our role in AgVic is a little bit different. We haven't been at the forefront of this. We've been watching it from across the border and trying to look after you guys and trying to prevent um, entry of Varroa to Victoria. So um, really what that's meant in Victoria when we had the detection in um, Newcastle, the first thing that we really had to do was um, assist the nas a national response by um, determining or demonstrating that we didn't already have Varroa here. So back at that time last June, um, we all got together with the different states and the different chief plant health officers and they said, well, how do you know it's not in Victoria? I said, I don't think it's in Victoria or I've got all these people doing sugar shakes over here and I've been doing the sentinel hive surveillance over here. And then I met these people called epidemiologists and they told me that was not good enough. And, um, yeah, you might be familiar with the... Armin campaign that we ran last year as a broad scale um, surveillance event. And I know that was long and painful for some of you that had your hives inspected, um, but we did manage to get a lot of data um, from that event, um, combined with a huge amount of beekeeper self reporting that um, we already actually had coming in at the start of this. Victoria was quite well positioned when I went to those meetings and got asked those questions about what data do you already have. Um, my predecessors in Joe, Daniel, Jess, etc., that have spent a lot of time setting up our Sugar Shake program and doing a lot of engagement with industry around that stuff, we did have quite good um, voluntary data coming in and we had um, a lot of Victorians that knew what they were doing in that space, but we had to do a lot more. Um, in order to demonstrate that. So at the end of Armand's last year, we were able to declare, um, epidemiologically speaking, that um, Victoria was varroa free. Um, and a lot of what we've been doing in Victoria over the last 12 months is things like maintaining a control area order, which is, you guys would know as the border restrictions or the border being closed. Um, and our job is to try and look at the at the risks uh, with introducing hives into Victoria. Having a look at that, what our permits team is doing at the moment is keeping a really close eye on this map as it expands and going through any of our permits and any of our movements that we've got into the state, checking that there's no other close links. A lot of the work we did in the beginning was the New South Wales response would feed down um, what we call traces or you would know as close contacts from COVID um, and we were following those up with state quarantine response teams um, to do surveillance and check that we didn't have spread into Victoria. And yeah, that's basically been what it's been like down here. Um, and we're just continuing to uh, try and keep those surveillance levels up and um, ensure that we're covering off those risks in Victoria. Thanks, Nikki. Liz? Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Frost, Technical Specialist for Department of Primary Industries at New South Wales. And uh, my predecessor, Doug Somerville, in his illustrious 30-year career, um, one of his top goals was to retire before Varroa got to Australia. And he's achieved that goal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> New South Wales, I... I'm not trying to have tickets on myself, but they're pretty lucky they've got me at this time because I'm, uh, I'm from the melting pot of pests and diseases that is California. <laughs> um, so in my role as technical specialist, it runs the gamut of uh, having to liaise, uh, be the key liaison between government and the New South Wales APRIS Association, our state peak body, um, and also uh, target DPI activities to the hot topics that beekeepers in New South Wales predominantly um, see as high risks to their industry. So uh, resource access, um, yeah, resource access, AFB, until Varroa. Um, queen access was one of those as well, so thus the National Honeybee Genetic Improvement Program uh, project uh, that Dr. Nadine Chapman from Sydney Uni and I um, are the, the lead managers of, and that program we hope to uh, continue through the CRC, the Cooperative Research Center for Pollination Security, uh, with additional colleagues joining the Plan B fold um, from right here in Victoria. And that program will continue in importance because it uh, brings to Australia the capacity uh, to build on previous breeding programs 
uh, where they've had a centralized breeding program, which we did in Plan B as well, that um, was euthanized because it was engulfed in a red zone. Uh, but we did have access to a queen preservation protocol. So we had 50 queens assessed. Uh, Wayne Horner did all the queen handling. DPI entomologists visually inspected those. Uh, but we didn't have a very good season last year like you guys as well. So the two queen brooders we had spread our uh, eggs across two baskets got those yards where the queens were introduced cut off by flooding. We had a, a potential theft issue. We had a potential fire issue. But anyways, so we've got a real small core nucleus from that breeder uh, population. But that's not the only thing we were doing with this program either. So we've created a manual for Australian conditions, um, reviewing everything that's out there in the research extension space. We've intensively uh, asked Aussie beekeepers what are their top traits um, and developed a scoring guideline for characterizing what's in your hive and then leveraging that to select uh, better hives, healthier hives. And the goal obviously was to get the industry um, at a place they want to be to maintain a successful business uh, that's operating at a high level so that if you have additional costs such as varroa miticides, that's not going to set you out of business. Um, within the response, I've been, um, I suppose, brought in as a technical expert on varroa. I have uh, share a few things with Jason. I've been beekeeping for 17 years. Um, after I realized that forensic entomology is too smelly <laughs> and bees smell way nicer, I did a bit of a shift to honeybees. Um, from other insects. Um, and I suppose using my experience in the US in the extension space is a real strength in this, this current situation we find ourselves in. So working out uh, in the background to all this eradication um, program work that's continuing, working on contingency, making sure we've got plans, um, you know, if and when we're living with Varroa. It hopefully won't be anytime soon, but if it is, we'll have that stuff ready. We'll have permits ready for uh, miticide use and stuff to deploy so we're not hung out to dry. Well, there you go. You've heard a little bit from every, every person. You've got a bit of an idea where their, where their strengths are, what knowledge they've got. So let's just, um, now, this, the, the purpose of this panel tonight is to give information for you. So let's make it personal and, yeah, open it up for questions. Let's, um, yeah, start asking the experts. Has anyone got anything? No. No. Oh. Rod. So when you, before you go, Rod, um, when, you, when you ask your question, yeah, just at the same time as you're asking your question, you know, who, if you want someone particular to answer it or if it's to the whole group. Right, Rod Pavey, I'm from Western Australia, so a little bit out of the, uh, out of the firing zone at the moment. But um, just a question for, for Jason initially, uh, up a bit higher. Yeah, Jason, um, you, you talked about your, your death rates in New Zealand at the moment and you said it wasn't necessarily due to Varroa, but I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about that, uh, please. Um, <coughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, so, so I wouldn't say it's um, definitely not because of Varroa, but I would say it's not... Um, we can't be certain that it is, is Varroa yet either. Um, if you look at the... Where it, where, it, where it got to a high death rate um, also kind of coincides with uh, when, when COVID arrived in New Zealand, I think. Um, no, that one there. Um, so, you know, I do remember that the first year with the high death rate, um, we were actually locked down. Uh, during during our autumn time, so it was it was difficult to get out and feed bees and put in strips and things like that. Um, we also had staff disappear back to their own countries, um, and that 
that meant we were we were kind of working short staffed as well. And and I think that story could probably be repeated across a lot of um, businesses in New Zealand at that time. Um, so um, although the 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 loss rate has gone up, I'm not I'm not convinced that we could put that down purely to Varroa. I think there could be other factors um, that have also caused that. Yeah. As an interesting observation for Victorians on that slide there, I note that um, that 13.5 percent. They must have a lot of colonies of bees and must have nearly 500,000 hives in New Zealand. Anyway, in Victoria, we only have 130,000 hives registered. So that loss, 97,000, is nearly equivalent to all of our bee hives. <laughs> Just to put, yeah, yeah, that, to put that in context for you, like that's nearly all of us. Yeah, and I, th I think also at that time, the. Um colony numbers in New Zealand was peaking um, at just under a million colonies. Um, there's, there was also a lot of people starting to exit the industry and potentially walking away from hives, um, which would probably be counted in that figure, I think. Dr. Um, we've had five zones in Australia for a long time. Uh, to get ready for this, um, is it? Uh, d does Victoria think that they should cut the border off completely and have a sixth zone? Who would you reckon that? Who was that for, Lindsay? Was that for Nikki? Uh, Nikki. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so. Uh, yeah, Arbic and the industry have pushed the five zone plan for a long time and I believe in the past um, that the VAA and our policy people have pushed back on that. Um, but at the current time, I don't believe there's a position um, necessarily, um, but at the moment it's being managed more. We've got the permit system in place at the moment. so. What it looks like in reality is somewhere in between. We're addressing the risks through the borders open, but there's a permit system and there's a policy around whether we close again. I mean, they reserve the right. I don't make those decisions, Lindsay, either, by the way. <laughs> I'm in operations, but um, they, they do reserve the right to close the border, but um, they're doing their very best in order to balance business continuity and keeping it open for people and addressing risks at the same time. And that's how we've ended up with the permit system that we have at the moment. And there's several commercial beekeepers in the room here that regularly travel to New South Wales and back to Victoria and they're currently able to do so. Um, they were locked out for a considerable amount of time until we managed to demonstrate um, the Blue Zone Area Freedom in New South Wales is a really, really important piece of work that's allowed us to open the border here. And same with um, the Area Freedom Declaration here, that's allowed us to open the border, but we still have measures in place um, within the permit system to address that risk, I suppose. So it's somewhere in between. I don't think there's, there's not an official policy, I don't believe, that the Victorian government has on that. But um, I'm also, yeah, not, not in the policy place. Um, just to, before you go, Lindsay, um, just as a bit of background for everyone in terms of this five zone plan, Back in 1998, um, the, the uh, Federal Council of Australian Apiarists Association come up with a policy um, that has carried through since that time of the, the plan for a five zone area within New Zealand, uh, within Australia. So the, what the five zone means is um, we knew back then that Varroa was very hard to control. And unless you've got some natural barriers to movement, with the amount of movement we need to do as beekeepers here in Australia to pollinate food crops and to keep our bees alive, it's going to be very hard to keep it still. So the honeybee industry was very proactive and come up with a policy and a plan to say, instead of blocking things off by state borders, which in a number of cases are just a river or a line on a map, which bees do not respect at all, same as they don't respect fences, decided to come up with a plan and break in Australia up into five zones where there was some natural barriers or there wasn't 
um, bee movement happening between regions. And so that's a, that's a policy that Arbic has continued on from Federal Council and has put forth to governments, um, and governments have uh, they've, they've noted it, um, but have yet to make a formal decision as to whether they support that or not, and, it's, um, and, and we will see. And that, and that five zone plan is to come into effect only when Varroa is declared uneradicable, which we're not anywhere near at the moment. And so, but if we come to that time, um, break Australia into five zones. So for us in Victoria, and it basically means that the eastern seaboard of Australia, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland would operate as one zone and there should be normal movement, not border controls. So that's something that was promoted by Arbic. Um, and it is still the Arbic policy today. So that's just a bit of background for you on the whole five zone thing. Um, Lindsay. Um, to Danny. So we're fighting the good fight. and We've lost a lot of hives and we're trying to get rid of all the feral bees. How do you, how, what's your gut feeling? Are we getting on top of it? Um, I think I, um, we've described in the webinar just last week about the decision making process in the response. Uh, 26 different parties all involved, all have varying levels of expertise. Um, the CCEPP, which is the technical committee in the response plan, has all the technical expertise from each of those parties sit on that. Um, so there are people that sit in that response making the decisions that have far more um, greater experience than I do in biosecurity. Um, and they're from right across Australia and they've all been involved, particularly the, the government parties, involved in eradicating some much harder to eradicate pests perhaps than varroa um, and we've had a long history of being able to do that. Something like citrus canker uh, is a pest that hasn't been eradicated anywhere else but we've done it four times in Australia. So do I think we're on top of it? Um, I think we are as best we can. I've always said that this is a long game and that we are still in the early stages of the response. I think that we're getting greater confidence around the edge of the response and we're moving further into the containment part of a response. Um, and I think I've been very clear that the whole response will hinge on the two big risk factors being number one, will the baiting program be successful enough to take away the feral bees and remove the host? And number two, Will compliance be strong enough that we're not going to have beekeepers physically move it out of the zone? If we can manage those two risks and we can successfully bait and we don't have mites physically moved, um, I think it's quite achievable. Um, and I think we're on track for that. Any further questions? There's got to be more, surely. We've heard a bit today um, in Jason's talk this morning about how he's dealing, um, what chemicals you're using to uh, manage varroa. And we've heard throughout the last 12 months of all the different options that the world has. And I know that we're not at a stage where we're going to say, yes, we can use those because we're still at the, the fight stage. Is there a document that people who help our industry with supplies has a hierarchy of if we do change to, yes, we're going to give the okay to those chemicals, what they are, it, it, can we have a bit more of an idea? Because, you know, we've got a smattering, but, you know, which one? And I'll pass to Liz, because Liz is working on a project around this. Um, yes, so... That is a gap in our knowledge, exactly what chemicals are going to be effective here. The biggest problem here is our climate and some of the areas in Australia that are making honey for 12 months of the year and have full brood for 12 months of the year. That creates challenges, particularly around residues and using synthetic um, chemistry. We, as an industry, have gone to the two key funding bodies, being AgriFutures and Hort Innovations, at the very start of this response. So. I think I met with them in uh, July or August last year and said, look, we need some work around this to understand what we're going to be able to use in Australia. Um, and as a result, they've, they've formed two different projects. Um, the AgriFutures one is doing exactly that. It is looking globally at the practices they use 
um, and existing conventional practices and looking at what might fit for Australia. So you're looking at places in the US that have similar climates and trying to match it up. Uh, that project is, is a fair way down the track. We're expecting to start seeing some outcomes from that project in the, in the next few months. And there's a second project done by Hort Innovations, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. Liz is going to talk about because she is on it. Right, yeah, so the, I guess maybe the short answer to your main question, which is what can suppliers uh, look to? I suppose every everything that's registered now is an emergency use only for surveillance, so it's to be determined um, if eradication is not deemed feasible, uh, which, uh, yeah, which chemicals that the New South Wales Chief Plant Protection Officer would um, ask the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority uh, to approve for a general, yeah, general use permit. But in surveillance now, uh, Bayverol is the miticide strip that's being used um, for surveillance. And uh, I think we've got, yeah, emergency permits for Apivar, which is Amitraz is the active ingredient for that one, for Midaway Quick Strips, which formic acid is the active ingredient for that one. Um, and let's see here, in terms of the other uh, project, the Varroa Integrated Pest Management Project, that's led by Macquarie University, and it's uh, looking at the, there's bound to be crossover between the AgriFutures funded Sydney Uni led project and the Macquarie Uni one, but Macquarie Uni is also looking to um, hear from researchers that are in the developmental stages for either um, creating new chemistry or looking at disruptions to um, processes that the Varroa might has. For example, in New South Wales, we heard from um, the researcher, Dr. Samuel Ramsey, who discovered the Varroa doesn't feed on bee hemolymph, but feeds on the bee's fat body, which is analogous to our, our liver. Um, and he's looking at a pathway uh, to prevent the, the mite Varroa destructor is a super successful invasive parasite. Um, and what it does with that fat body in part, uh, it gains nutrition from it, but it also utilizes it in the development of its egg yolk um, for its progeny. So his research is um, looking at a lot of things, but one of the things is looking at disrupting that pathway from feeding on that fat body to utilizing it directly in its egg yolk protein. Liz, uh, you said earlier on that um, the, the process will be, and, and just ask you to confirm this, so, so first of all it's got to be deemed non-eradicable, and then the New South Wales Chief Plant Health Officer will apply to APVMA? Um, just to clarify the process, so at the moment in a response you work under emergency use permits, which we've had in place for years. They were held by PHA, Plant Health Australia, They've been transferred to the DPI because in the response they need a little bit more flexibility in some of those permits. And so they're emergency use permits. If we had to transition and we didn't have anything available, the, the DPI has the power to distribute strips to beekeepers in the affected areas. So there's always that as a backstop. What we're doing as an industry and working closely with the DPI is getting what they call shelf registration for every other option. Now, shelf registration is where you have full registration sitting on the shelf in the APVMA for the events that it is declared non, um, not technically feasible to eradicate when we transition. Then they can activate those shelf registrations, which then allows resellers to bring it into the country and sell it under a general use permit to all beekeepers who can use it under the label. We currently have, and I'm going to test my memory, Apitraz. Apivar in that app, sorry. Yeah, so we've got Api, Apivar has shelf registration, and we've also, also got Thymol with shelf registration currently. Um, and we are working very active, very close in getting Bayverol uh, with shelf registration. Uh, we're working towards formic acid, and I am in constant battle with the APVMA trying to find an option to get oxalic acid are registered as well. The issue we have with oxalic acid is that it is brutal on people, particularly fogging. Um, there's been a lot of reports around the world of, of issues with eyes, 
lung irritations, uh, burning of skin, and the APVMA are very wary of that. They've received advice from other countries that that, that them as countries are moving towards trying to decrease the use of the chemical because it is so dangerous. Um, and so we are trying to do that, but I'm not sure what it's going to look like or if we'll be able to get there. Um, and we're also working perhaps with oxalic acid strips, um, trying to get that registered as well. Um, but that's also not to say that something like formic acid is safe to use either. Um, formic acid is extremely brutal. In fact, Michelle Taylor just last week, who is a researcher in New Zealand, was telling me about how one of her techs um, was going out to treat the research hives and had the esky or the chili bin uh, full of formic acid and the tech thought uh, he would just open the lid of the esky to let it vent and then go and put on his mask and, and PPE and he woke up two hours later, <laughs> literally knocked him out clean just from the fumes of formic acid that came out of the chili bin. So it's organic but it isn't that safe either. Uh, going away from the, the current incursion of Varroa, um, about 10 or 12 years ago there was a great film produced which featured Dr Dennis Anderson and he talked about um, the two species, Jacob Sonai and Destructor. Um, and in that film it featured uh, a lot about um, the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, and its incursion into northern Queensland. And the suggestion was that if Serrana becomes uh, endemic uh, in northern Queensland and in fact moved south, which in fact at that stage was a fear, it would sort of create a superhighway for the incursion uh, of the Varroa since the, it was involved in, in conjunction with the Asian honeybee. Is the Asian honeybee a concern at all in this, uh, our, our total talk about Varroa? Um, I think it's important to point out that you know, Varroa destructor is one of 13 high pest species that we have as an industry of concern that we're trying to keep out of the country, which includes viruses and pests and um, diseases as well. So, um, so Sarani, it is endemic in northern Queensland now. Um, we've had two big incursions. One of them had Varroa on it, Jacob Sonai. We eradicated that. Um, the second incursion uh, is now established and it is moving south. Um, just uh, late last year, an extension to the known infested area occurred, moving further south. Is it a risk? Um, yeah, look, it, uh, I don't know that it would be any greater risk than feral bees being a super highway either. Um, you know, it can host on either species, destructor that is. Um, it could be a risk for further Jacob's own eye incursions or other varroa species. Um, even you know uvaro or something like that could could host through there um, and, and florea we've had multiple detections of that you know red dwarf honeybees as well so yes it is a risk does it does it mean if we can't control varroa that's going to create us a lot of headaches i don't know so it, it very well could and it's a great point it doesn't get trapeolabs Oh, trapeolaps, yeah, yeah. And, and that's really important. Liz is just saying, don't forget about, you know, trapeolaps mite. Um, you know, we heard in New South Wales conference that uh, trapeolaps mite is going to be much more devastating than Varroa. And it's right across the Torres Strait. It's just to the north of us. And as an industry, we're not really got it on our radar, right? So it's really important whilst we're fighting Varroa that we keep our surveillance program going and we keep a focus on the other 12 pests that we want to keep out of the country as well and not drop our guard. Any further questions? While we're waiting, just as a, um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, New Zealand, similar sort of thing to what Danny just said um, and was told to me from New Zealand beekeepers in 2007 is that yes, they feel felt at that time that they'd dropped a bit of the ball on Varroa. They were heavily concentrating on um, AFB control in 2000, and then they found they had Varroa. So it was, uh, yeah, you've actually got to keep your eyes on everything, not just right in front of you, but all the other stuff out there as well. Am I go? Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Um, we've got the, got the OK to have it on the shelf, this miter side strips and stuff, but uh, is there any templates in place for training for our industry people that can actually use it or we just get it off DPI and throw it in the hive? What's the go with all this? Yeah, great question. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the process of a biosecurity response is whilst we're in eradication, we're in eradication. We're focused on that end goal. If it gets to the point where the CCPP and ultimately the NMG decide it's no longer feasible and we need to transition to management, it releases a lot of funds. So part of that process is then the combative state, in this case New South Wales DPI, produce a transition to management plan similar to the response plan that then goes through that decision making tree and gets approved. And in that plan, it has the same cost sharing rules. So all 26 parties put money into a plan that we then, um, that we use to assist in the transition to management and make it easier for our industry. Those plans typically go, typically, typically go for 12 months to potentially 18 months. Uh, and has a big focus around uh, education, delivery, training for beekeepers. Uh, and we've, got to, we've also got to remember, like, if it's deemed to not be eradicable, then it's not going to be across New South Wales tomorrow, right? We, we, the whole, one of the pillars of a transition and management plan is to continue to hold um, the line as long as they can, in this case around New, Newcastle, to buy us enough time, that 12 to 18 months, to roll out the education, the training to beekeepers, to get the strips in the country, get them to, to beekeepers, to make sure everyone is armed and we minimise uh, the impact to our industry. And I think this is also important because a lot of people say, why are we even bothering with this? If we pull the flag as an industry and as an industry we say to, the, to SEP that we're not even interested, we think it's no way it's possible, we're giving up, well, that's it. We don't get a transition to management plan. We're off the cliff. We're on our own. We have to manage it all by ourselves. And we don't get to cost share it against the other 26 parties. So not only, I think, whilst there's a chance, we need to take it because everyone tells us that if they have their time over, they'd much rather not have a role. Um, but we need to see the process through too because at the end of the line, if we can't do it, we get assistance as well. So does that answer your question? I'll just sort of jump in first if I could. A suggestion could be, Ron, as well, that um, we can all still be proactive about it as well. Um, you, we've got a neighbour who's uh, had a role for since 2000 in New Zealand. Uh, there's an opportunity there for everyone to jump on a plane and go and see. Lindsay's just come back from America. They've had Varroa for longer. So find some mates and, um, and might actually ask Jason whether he reckons is there a, um, a business opportunity for Varroa tourism for Australian beekeepers over New Zealand. <laughs> or, or could you do with some free labour, Jason, and they can learn Varroa management at the same time? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, just a short one. Brian Hastings, um, to anyone on the panel, there's no worry. You've spoken about oxalic acid fumes, right, which is, and I agree, toxic. But what happens if you actually treat the wood in oxalic acid so that you've actually got a base product which is there then as it ages, it will slowly seep out of the wood and as such treat the particular hive um, in the long term. So it's not a short-term fix, but a long-term uh, program by the treatment of the wood pre um, having um, bees within it. Brian, this is a classic beekeeper inventiveness that I love to hear. It means you're up for up for the task and being creative. Um, unfortunately, with oxalic acid, it has to be a contact um, treatment, so it's either vaporized. You know, you vaporize it in the hive for 10 to 15 minutes, and the hive has to be all, you know, quite quite airtight, except for the yeah front entrance. Or you use it in a liquid form, either. The Americans like to call it a drench, um, but it's really more of a dribble in between the frames. But it has to be a contact 
transfer. So you're getting it on the bees. There's grooming behavior that's happening. It's actually touching the mites that are um, out and open and on bees, not in the brood. So it's a, it's I guess a quick contact and release that one. So it's it's not a slow release formula oxalic at this stage. I was just going to add that um, I've also just been to New Zealand and we saw the oxalic acid treatments in action and nobody that I saw was wearing a mask. <laughs> I don't know if that's common, but I was coughing. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. and I also had a commercial beekeeper describe to me that um, I think some of us sitting here are thinking that this chemical use is very nice and, and you might have a different experience. This is the people I saw. Um, is nice and ordered and you do one treatment and then you do the next one and it's working and things like that. But um, the way it was described to me over there was that New Zealand's now in its street fighting phase and they're basically doing anything to keep those colonies alive. And I saw a lot of people um, layering treatments. So when they're saying they're starting to use oxalic acid, what I saw was those were hives that already had bayerol strips hanging in them or um, other strips hanging in them and they weren't satisfied that in the stronger colonies and the larger colonies that the traditional um, synthetics were cut in the mustard and so they would do a um, oxalic fumigation treatment as well on top. So they were sort of layering these treatments which um, as a regulator was really fascinating to see. <laughs> and it'll be, in, they, yeah, they sort of said in the first 10, 15 years that was working, one thing in the spring, one thing in the autumn, but as time was going on, yeah, I thought the term street fighting phase was my favourite thing that I learnt there. And it's, uh, yeah, well, some of what I witnessed was, was definitely that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter and the panel. Means a lot uh, that you're holding this tonight. Thank you. Um, we're a bit over three weeks out of almonds. This doesn't have to be for Nikki, but how, how are things looking? Are uh, the bees coming into Victoria now? Are they stationing close to the almonds? Um, are they meeting all their might wash requirements? And how are we looking? Are we going to get full quota of bees for Victoria? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. So, um, yeah, so last year we obviously didn't allow hives in from New South Wales and we managed to get 84 or 86,000 hives in. They traditionally aim for around 150,000, I think, unless there's someone from the Armand board here that wants to correct me. Tim's up there, 150. Um, so last year we got about 84, 86,000 in, so we were under last year. This year we should be on track, mostly because we are open to the blue zone of New South Wales, and the only people that can't come now are anyone that's had um, contact with one of the red or purple zones on Danny's map. Um, there are quite a lot Oh, I don't have the current number. There's at least 30 or 40,000 hives that have already come over the border that are sitting on overwintering sites up in the Sunraysia. Um, last year we had everyone doing permits, Victorians and interstaters. This year Victorians are moving in as normal and interstaters are coming in with permits. And so basically Victoria accepts the blue zone um, of New South Wales pest free uh, area freedom claim. Um, but we're still taking a cautious approach and we're still applying these permit conditions to everyone coming in. Um, the permit conditions involve mite washing um, two weeks prior to entry, so everyone's doing that from any state, so South Australia, Queensland, ACT and New South Wales all doing the same. Um, and the mite washing is alcohol washes at the rate that you might remember from originally in the blue zone. We originally made it to match so it would be simple for people, but New South Wales has since updated theirs to 23 hives. Our mite washing requirements is 64 hives and above, uh, up to 64 hives 100%, 64 to 640, 64 and above that 10% alcohol washes. So they have to be done two weeks um, prior to entry and beekeepers have to write on their lids what they're doing. Um, they also have to log every movement of exactly where their bees are while they're in Victoria with our BMAX system. And yeah, we have, we've got offices um, going out, not next week, the week after, to start um, checking all of those hives that have started to come across. Um, so yeah, almonds this year, it's not gonna be a broad scale surveillance event like it was last year. We're not chasing these area freedom numbers. 
um, what it is is a really targeted um, surveillance and compliance event. We're looking at where the gaps are, we're looking at where the risks are, so that all involved checking all of the permit holders, um, ensuring their hives are where they say they are, they're marked on the lid that they've been inspected, anything that doesn't look like it has been inspected will be inspected. Um, and the second part to almonds is, um, so last year a lot of Victorian hives were um, alcohol washed as well. This year we will be doing alcohol washing on our Victorian hives again, but we have done a whole bunch of work, which is what we normally do every year. We contact all commercial beekeepers with 50 hives and above prior to almonds and ask them to send us in their certificate of compliance with the code. Listen to the biosecurity officer talk about the code. Um, and so we've done that again this year and, and we basically risk rate all of you on a big spreadsheet and we determine um, who's got the highest levels of compliance and the lowest and that's how we target our field um, based operation. And this year we have, Ali has, she's better at Excel than me, um, heavily targeted that equation to target, so it's weighted to target people that haven't been doing their mite washes and reporting them to us. So um, I've done run a couple of compliance campaigns, people with over 50 hives might have noticed in um, this year, asking people to send in their mite check records and basically people that haven't complied with that are who we're going to be targeting with alcohol washes with the squirt teams. We've got two squirt teams coming up, much smaller operation just for a few weeks in August. So there'll be a longer permit compliance operation first, that starts in a few weeks, and then there'll be two weeks of um, field surveillance targeting Victorians where we, where we um, see the gaps. People that haven't been self-reporting, we're going to go out and um, do surveillance on those. And the third part to Armand's is um, I'm going to have all of our emergency response trailer and gear and that ready to scale up. If we, So we're already going to have two squirt teams there, but we've still got 55 state, when I say squirt, state quarantine response team members. We've still got 55 on the books um, and I'll have the emergency trailers, the Baverol, the um, sticky mats and the strips and everything, they're ready to go. So if we do get either a trace forward situation, so a hive that's come across and there's a new detection back in New South Wales and we get notified they're already here, I can get teams there straight away with sticky mats and miticides. Um, and or if, yeah, worst case, if we've got a detection on this side that we've got a uh, local control centre or a Ford command post kind of field crew ready to go. So, yeah, three parts to Armand's permit compliance, um, might washes on uh, the Victorians that haven't been already complying with it and, um, and the preparedness element, I suppose. That's what we're doing this year. That's what we've got in store. We've actually um, booked this session, so it's due to go from 7 till 10, but pretty much, you know, we've had a little bit of presentation. We need interaction from you, so if you want to, this is an opportunity, ask questions. We've got time, it's only 10 past 8, so keep them coming. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about bee genetics, so like genetics for housekeeping and grooming. Is that an urban myth or is there something in that? Yes, so um, bee genetics and resistance to pests uh, can be done with traits um, of any livestock. Our health and kind of disease resistance traits are a um, little bit harder to select for than production traits. So honey production is one of those that's highly heritable, which is sweet for Australia because that's what most of our cash receipts are from, honey. Um, disease selection is a bit harder and it's even harder when you don't have the pest of concern established to select for that resistance. So in the Australian scenario, uh, we would look to overseas selection and, and research in that space. So in New Zealand, for example, um, Ray Butler, queen breeder, she's been selecting for Varroa sensitive hygiene, uh, which is a behavioral trait where um, the worker bees can sense uh, Varroa infested cap cell, uncap that cell, which just the act of uncapping disrupts varroa reproduction, um, but at higher expression levels, it can um, mean that those workers also remove the pupae, um, which removes that, that feeding um, opportunity uh, for the female mites that could 
or would have emerged eventually from that cell, uh, fertilized, ready to infest um, a new cell after feeding on an adult bee. So it's not it's not an urban legend or urban myth, but it's um, it's a lot of labor intensive work to um, to score that trait um, and select for it. Uh, there's a couple of um, breeding programs for that trait around the world. So Hort Innovation funded um, an importation project to test the post-entry quarantine facility at Mickleham, Victoria, and uh, Bee Scientifics, David Briggs and CSIRO John Roberts were involved in that project to test proof of concept through that quarantine facility. Um, and that was a successful trial of the quarantine facility. So that stock came from uh, the Netherlands from Arista, um, the Arista company, which trialed, um, they were in collaboration with Project Apis mellifera, um, or PAM for short, in the US, which was working with a Hawaii queen breeder, also selecting for that varroa sensitive hygiene trait in collaboration with the US Department of Ag as well. So that's a long story, but it is selectable, and there's different. I suppose, tools to select for varroa resistance. Um, the simplest one would be keeping track of your mite levels and your, um, yeah, your survivability over winter. There's a queen brooder in South Dakota who um, is treatment free. He started his stock, he got the, pardon my French, but he got the shits with chemical treatments and the expense and he thought, okay, well, I'll try and use this USDA Russian stock that um, USDA was testing and did show greater um, survival and mite suppression uh, than other US stocks. Uh, but he, I guess he wears 30% losses every year, but he doesn't have to have to treat. So he selects for number one, he earmarks top honey producers, and then number two, who survived over winter. And that's his super simple, very slow selection method because it's um, open mating as well. Um, and then another kind of glimmer of hope in that Varroa uh, resistance space is a researcher from um, North Carolina, Dr. Kyra Wagner. She is developing um, an assay called unhealthy um, brood odor, UBO, she's calling it. Uh, and that is a synthesized concoction of bee pheromones, so it's like um, unhealthy bee perfume, and it's more sensitive than hygienic testing, because with hygienic testing and the freeze kill brood, you're killing the brood, so it's fully dead, right? It's like, that should be like woofy as, and your bees hopefully would, would find and remove that. But with this uh, unhealthy brood pheromone, she just spritzes it on uh, a smaller circle of cap brood, and it doesn't kill the brood under those cappings. So it's a, I guess, a more sensitive, um, yeah, characteristic of this this behavior of of finding unhealthy, potentially varroa uh, infested brood. So that's kind of a hopeful uh, assay, quicker assay that's much less labor intensive, that's showing real promise. They've been doing intensive trials on um, stock in the U.S. Um, in Australia, CSRO has done some trials, and Queen Brooder Quinn, Corinne Jordan in Queensland has done some trials too. Um, so there's some hope there, but breeding is the long game, I suppose. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Tim Jackson from the Armand Board. Uh, Bianca, no. you're the only one who hasn't <laughs> okay. had to answer a question, so I thought I'd make you not know, public servant sitting up on a on a Thursday night into overtime must be costing us taxpayers a fortune. I'm not paid by taxpayers. <laughs> no, I know. I'm only joking. I'm talking about the two, two ladies either side of you. <laughs> um, I only jest, but Bianca, you, you, it seemed like it was a fairly emotional, like the, the Varroa incursion has been a very personal experience for yourself. Um, as part of the response plan, there's a lot of money uh, being dedicated to compensation for losses. I'm just wondering if you could give us a bit of a, a on the ground feel as to whether you feel that compensation is uh, doing the job that uh, it was intended to do. Great question. Um, I can only really talk to my own experience in the compensation or the reimbursements that I've received. Um, essentially they're set up so that people can 
um, take the, 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 the money that they've received um, and shift some, some of that money to an area where they can continue to beekeep. Um, unfortunately for me, the red zone pretty quickly swallowed up my home base. Um, I'm also pretty dedicated to my job, so running colonies at the moment is really... Um, I don't have time either. So that's another decision that was made by myself and my husband to not continue to beekeep at this point in time. doesn't mean we won't go back, but it's um, time-consuming to travel the distance that I'd need to do to get to the blue zone um, to run bees in the blue. But that's what that essentially is for, is for the commercial space is my understanding, and Danny can correct me if I'm not right, but it is to start again. Um, it doesn't cover the labour, it doesn't cover... Um, there is essentially a small payment um, of uh, about $117 for a uh, loss of, of honey, um, which doesn't cover a full 12 months. It's really meant for about a three-month period, which would give people time to, and lots of people have, go and purchase more, more colonies um, and equipment and start up again in another area. Lots and lots of beekeepers that I've come across, um, many that I'm talking to still, maybe they're operating in the purple zone, or maybe their home base is in a red, but they've still got bees out in the blue zone. There are a lot of people out there that have taken up um, the opportunity to reinvest elsewhere. Um, that has its challenges, though. There are people um, that have sites in the red zones that maybe have public land sites or private sites that they no longer can use. Um, you may not have opportunities to use sites in the blue zone if you're not, you know, frequenting that area, it's a bit like saying you're a Sunraiser beekeeper and you've lost all your sites, you're just going to move south. It doesn't really work that way for everybody unless you're connected, unless you've got um, a large range that you work from. So essentially for me, um, the money's sitting there waiting for me to do something with down the track. But um, it, I guess what you don't see when you look at me is that my shed sitting at home with um, all the money I've spent so far um, with an extraction plant that's waiting to be locked in and set up that was waiting this year for that, or oh, well, last year, last season. Um, a whole bunch of, of gear that we purchased ourselves and built. We were pretty stingy. We used to buy it, build it, dip it, paint it, send it on its way out to the field. So there's a lot of gear at my place that's lovely and fresh and clean and ready to go, um, waiting. Um, so there's those sorts of things that sort of sit in the background at the moment in my life that are just waiting for the chance to get back to it. There's probably lots of people that have the same thing. Um, I didn't keep my gear. A lot of beekeepers in the red zones, when they lose their hives, can elect to um, have the bees euthanized, but to keep the equipment, which wouldn't be the frames, but essentially lids, bases and the boxes. Um, so there are some people that may have taken that up. I personally didn't have time to stop working in the response or in my role at um, TOCAL in the training space to go out and open up and clean out. I just didn't deal with that. And I didn't do that for our education colonies either at the college, um, which did not receive any compensation. It's just as a disclaimer for the taxpayers in the room. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, emotional is, is really, that's the nail on the head. It's been interesting to watch people around me, friends and um, associates in the industry, slowly sort of come to terms with the loss um, that has happened in the red zones. And the recent detections are actually just for your information, useless information. Um, a lot of it is in my backyard, so I'm right in the middle of the red zone near Allworth, but um, the, the most recent one is Main Creek, which is where I grew up as a kid. So. Um, I know the territory and I know that it's very hilly, it's very, uh, it's basically a state forest, so there's difficulties that I can see being a local person in the response as well and giving um, some assistance in terms of floor resources for the, the knowledge and the background um, for the baiting program to push them when I know that stuff's not flowering to make hay while the sun shines and get those bait stations out in some of the areas that I'm very acutely aware are not flowering and that there's a great opportunity to attract bees for the bait stations to be successful. So there's a bit of that as well, which is part of um, the value that I've given to the response in, in my position. 
uh, to Liz. Um, you didn't have very uh, much time to get uh, going on the breeding program. Um, you really had to close it down, but I, I do, do believe, believe you saved some of the queens. And so where are they now? And uh, what are you going to do with them in the future? They're in a top secret DPI ag location, Lindsay, because I've had some theft issues, man. I can't tell you where they are. But uh, they've been moved there under permit. <laughs> so DPI knows where they are. Um, yeah, they're under lock and key at one of DPI's 17 research stations within New South Wales. And um, there's a whopping 30 left at this stage, Lindsay, unfortunately. But um, they're in a bit of a holding pattern. We're hoping to get a hold of some of that um, unhealthy brood odor assay. So the few that are left are representative of the national population. Um, when I started the program, I cast the net out very wide to try and get um, representation of the genetics around Australia. So we got um, some queens from uh, WA, the best, uh, Better Bees WA program that utilizes Rottnest Island um, for control of mating. Uh, queens queens from, from the Horners, um, Stevens is in Tassie, um, later down the track, some queens related to the um, import led by uh, Jody Gertz, David Briggs, and John Roberts. Queensland, um, queens from Corinne Jordan, and um, some other local New South Wales queen breeders. And uh, Nadine Chapman from Sydney Uni did genetics testing on the DPI population, which showed it was kind of sitting in the middle between um, WA and then the New South Wales, Queensland, Tassie genetics we got tested as well so um, I think it'll be it'll be neat to maintain that core population which we can build it up at any time but we're being very cautious at the moment just um, whilst the eradication continues and we're building um, building up a body of work to be part of the cooperative um, research center for pollination security which would see us refresh that population so that part of the project is on hold, but we've been going hammer and tong with our other collaborators at University of New England's Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit. They've developed a database uh, based on their other livestock industries that now is available for use uh, with beekeepers, and we've been kind of forging a, a path with Australia's um, genome research facilities trying to get a workable uh, genotyping service for honeybees. It's it's actually, yeah, it doesn't exist in almost any country. In Europe, they've got um, a company called Eurofins that has a, a bit of a, yeah, a, a chip that can read honeybee DNA and um, hopefully reconstruct some of that pedigree. Uh, so we've yeah, we're forging kind of new territory here for large-scale beekeeping, and it's a, it's a path worth worth striving on because we're so unique here in Australia. We're large scale. You know, most of the genetic research on bees has heavily been um, out of Europe and European beekeeping is not Australian beekeeping whatsoever. So it makes sense for us to be developing local solutions. Um, question for Jason. Um, Given the size of the business you're running in New Zealand, in New Zealand, excuse me, um, seems to be a pretty reasonable size by Australian standards. Um, I believe that there will be, if if it does, Varroa does, you know, fly the coop. Um, there'll be a lot of beekeepers over here interested in the more organic um, treatments versus the more synthetics in your Bavarols and Appy whatevers. Um, your experience as a commercial beekeeper, does it have the same effect? Does it build up resistance and that sort of thing a lot quicker? Um, and, and what does the rotation look like for you between maybe an organic and a more synthetic? Um, apologies if I'm behind the eight ball and you talked about this earlier. Um, so I know, I know there's a few people in New Zealand that are running purely organic beekeeping um, it's it's quite difficult um, given the, the distance you've got to be from uh, main roads and um, chemicals that farmers use glyphosate and things like that um, so yeah there's, there's there's a very small handful of people running 
organic operations. Um, my understanding with the organic strips, uh, or oh, sorry, the organic treatments, <coughs> they can work, but they require a lot of extra, a lot of extra monitoring and a lot of extra time to um, to make sure you get a good result. I've got one, probably. Probably no one's game enough to say it. Uh, probably to Danny and to Nikki. If got, we don't want it to happen, but if it's found in the almonds, what is that going to do to the national plan? And what's Victoria stand? <laughs> so, um, Yes, this is what I lose sleep about at night, Ken, because the minute we find it in the Victorian almonds, I don't know, I'm going to die. Anyway, but um, the uh, basically Victoria's got a plan in place. So Victoria doesn't make that decision. That does go to the CCEPP, the technical working group that Arbic and um, Danny's been talking about. Um, my team's job in that situation is to... Um, get the information on the ground and get that information to the CCEPP so they can make a smart decision. So um, what it would likely look like, um, it'll take them a little while to make a decision, so in the interim, it would likely look like the initial um, load or beekeeper and what we call an infested premise, an IP, would likely be destroyed and everything else around will start to do a whole bunch of surveillance. But it depends on the tracing information, so that's not for sure. So it'll trigger tracing. Our teams will be tracing, doing surveillance, and there may be a small amount of destruction initially, and we will be funneling through the best information we can get to the CCEPP, who ultimately make a decision on whether the detection is closely linked to the New South Wales um, uh, outbreak and it's maybe those hives have literally been in Victoria for two days. We destroy them or turn them around and send them back and we do surveillance and we're still on track for eradication. Or if the scenario is that the detection um, in Victoria, we can't find reliable tracing links, it looks like, you know, uh, the cat's really out of the bag, that will go to the CCPP and, um, yeah, any detection outside of the red and purple zone at the moment triggers a, um, a review of the response plan and it goes back for them to decide whether um, it's TFE, so technically feasible to eradicate. So there's certain triggers built into the plan at the moment and, and a detection in Victoria would absolutely be one of those triggers where they go back and they sit around the table again and they say, look, can we really do this? And they look at the costs, they look at the tracing and the scientific information and they look at all those things and they make that decision. So Victoria doesn't really make that call. Um, my job on the ground and working with you guys is to get that really good information there. And that's why with our permit system, we're asking for people to put their movement locations and their might wash records and that there so that we have a lot of that tracing information on hand. But the other part of that is under the Victorian legislation, all of you guys going to Armands have an obligation to keep really, really good records. And I do have an expectation, and I'll, um, you'll hear me talk about it tomorrow in my presentation, that um, uh, record keeping is one of the things we're really targeting at the moment because being able to have tracing information quickly is really, really important. And we have been doing a few compliance cases and issuing fines in Victoria at the moment for people that haven't been able to answer our questions about where their hives have been quite rapidly. So, um, yeah, my ask to you guys is to make sure that your records for all your hives are really up to date because the faster we can get that information and the more accurate we can get that information to the CCPP, the better decision they can make. There's nothing worse than being asked to make some awful decision with very little information. So that's my role and our role in it is to get that information up there and then they'll make a call, basically. No, the only... The only thing I might add is um, I know last year's arm and we did some scenario planning where, because the main thing, you, when you hear that as a beekeeper, you're going to say, well, what are they going to do, make me stand still in the middle of an almond orchard and end of flowering and, and all that and we end up robbing and create bigger problems. So what we talked about last year was potentially if we're in a scenario, 
where that happens and you're towards the end of flowering, um, there's likely, and I assume this is potentially still the plan, that under strict permit conditions, you're going to be able to move off of almonds to designated canola crops potentially nearby. Um, and then that will allow the bees to then be able to get there in surveillance to happen and prevent rubbing until they get a handle or a decision out of the set about what the next movement is. Um, so that's the, yeah, everything else. Yeah, that's true. And that's, that is the most stressful thing about detection at almonds for me is that we won't be able to do surveillance in situ like we normally would. So with a detection at Port of Melbourne or anything like that, you're in people's backyards, everyone stays still, that's fine. But on the almonds, when that flowering finishes, there's going to be a world of pain. We're going to have to find sites. We've got sites pre-identified with um, the Monsons and the Almond Board and things like that where we can possibly go to. Um, but, yeah, we're going to have to allow some movement and accept that as part of the surveillance when we do it because we won't be able to keep... Um, when those flowers finish... Um, uh, yeah, I've seen the bees robbing there, so yeah, it, it will be a difficult surveillance task and it will be a large one because of the numbers of hives in a small area. Normally you'd draw a 10 kilometre circle around where beehives are at any other time of the year and it would be a manageable task, but that task, if I drop a pin on an almond orchard and draw a 10 kilometre circle, that's all square. I mean, it's, that's, that's a big, really big surveillance task. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be big <laughs> if that happens. I'll just add into the conversation the potential and why it's important to actually go and find out and for Nikki to do her job and, uh, and gather the information. We could be so focused on the Varroa, if it does, we do find in Armand, it mightn't come from Newcastle. It could have come from South Australia and come across. So it could have come from WA or Victoria. So it's, you know, while we're so focused up there, we've still got to be watching all the rest of Australia as well. Uh, my question is for Bianca. Um, how are you going with manpower with the New South Wales response? With, with who, sorry? With the... Um, manpower. Yes. Right. Clear. Got it. Um, well, personally, um, I was managing the teams out of Tokal for between October and December um, in the department as a team member on the response team. Um, there is a s roughly 40 um, t surveillance tasking uh, teams and field crews that operate out of Tokal, which is the largest part of the response, the largest manpower in the response, man and woman power in the response. Um, that, yeah, that someone described to me the other day that when we find new red zones, um, which is not surprising given the number of surveillance events that are going on in the purple zone, that it's a bit like painting the harbour bridge, that they get on top of where they need to be and they've reached that first round of surveillance, which is an enormous milestone for all those people to have contributed to that. But then we chip in and find a new one and then it's more hives to be euthanised, more potentially more purple zone to then pick up more surveillance. So... They're working very hard. I've never seen a team of people more dedicated to their job. Um, as I said, they're getting abuse. Um, they're getting. They're having to explain lots and lots of things to people who maybe at this point in time thought that they'd be immune to um, having to deal with the response on their doorstep. So the growth in the red zones and the purple zones has made a few more people having to come into contact with the surveillance teams. They're definitely... Um, stretched, if I have to say that, and my honest opinion is they're stretched pretty pretty thin. Um, the expansion of the southern part, which is the central coast region, has created its own problems in that um, there are a lot of recreational beekeepers down in that central coast area and there is a lot of areas, especially, and we've mentioned St Albans, which is one of the further west um, areas of the central coast, which is that bottom complex. Um, it's really... It's hilly, it's, it's bushland, it's, I don't, I'm not local to Victoria but I can't give you an example of the similarities but there's a lot of um, dense housing but also lots of floral resources as well. So there's challenges not just for the B teams on the ground doing surveillance because there's no running water, there's no telephone service. Um, they've got 
baiting teams that are living in a house together because there's no accommodation for them to live in um, in the meantime. So they've gone to the extreme of um, using satellite phones. They're operating out of a, a house that they've managed to rent um, because it's a huge distance from the, the central coast um, centre of where they were normally working from to go out to St Albans every day to complete their work. So um, the northern ex expansion, as in the new two dots that were up north of Newcastle um, at Main Creek and uh, Stroud Road recently, that, that's actually stretching teams again a little bit more. And every time um, we talk about tracing and um, when things have changed on the map, we're also thinking about what the owner reimbursement costs um, allude, allude us to about that zone or that new area. So the teams are very thin. They're working six days a week. Um, they're coming from all different areas across the state. So lots of people that took on those roles in the beginning of October were told they'd be at TOCAL for two weeks for training. Um, they're still there and it's... July. So they've, they've committed to something that I don't think any of us could understand unless we'd known them or seen them and seen them in action and watched them go in and out every day um, doing that really important work on behalf of the industry. So some of them are beekeepers. Most of them are beekeepers. Most of them um, have been within a red zone or, you know, in a purple zone potentially as well. And some of them are from out in the blue zones of New South Wales um, and come into that response space and working really long hours, really big days, um, yeah, under pretty pressurising situations. I hope that answers your question. They've, they're working super hard. I've never seen a group of people that are, that are working that hard in, um, in department, like the way that they are. They're very dedicated and they'd have to be to be doing what they're doing. Um, Victoria's also started to send a few resources up again. We did at the beginning and we haven't for a while because we've been busy doing things down here, but um, uh, my boss's boss is going up soon to relieve the incident controller for three weeks so she can have a break because I imagine people are um, pretty tired. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's help coming in, I believe, too, from interstate. We're only sending a handful of people, but, yeah, to try and help out as well. Bianca, a question for you while everyone else is thinking of a further question to, to keep going on. Um, you've come on as the Varroa Coordinator for Arbic um, to take some of the workload off, off Danny, who, as we know, gets his jobs from communicated to him by Steve, the chair, from the executive of Arbic. So what's the day like for you? What's, what's your normal day? What are you doing for, for our industry? Okay. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, I work from home, so I'd never stop working, essentially. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so regularly Monday to Friday is the norm, but um, I'm doing lots of longer hours and sometimes talking to Danny or other people on the weekend because I haven't got time through the week to catch up with everything. So essentially at the start, I was um, joining into the incident management team briefs every morning with the response. That has dropped off, um, which is also a blessing in that it takes a lot of time and sometimes we're hearing uh, things that are not necessarily directly related to me. It might be something about finance, might be people talking about how to lodge their um, timesheets because they're new to the department, etc. So the reduction now is sort of two days a week, a Tuesday and a Thursday, that I sit in the IMT meeting. Um, I'm working across a couple of things. Um, I will often have meetings with um, beekeepers over the phone that are affected by the response, either waiting for a permit or talking about a non-approved permit. Um, they might have an issue with, um, with their ORC claims. Um, I also then sometimes occasionally talk to the field crews that are in the, in the TOCAL space. I've been going in and out of TOCAL every now and again, visiting my old, my old stomping ground. Um, and getting feedback from the field um, about what those teams are experiencing. So I'm um, willingly taking information from field crews to get their side of some of the stories that I'm hearing from the other side, which is beekeepers calling and talking or emailing and getting their points across. Um, I'm also pushing and um, 
working out all of the industry updates. If you're not registered as a subscriber to Arbic, please do that if you'd like regular updates from Arbic about the response. Um, I put those out as often as I possibly can. Um, I work with the department in their communications team to tailor some of the content that goes out in emails to beekeepers, whether they're a new red zone or a new purple zone or just an update to all beekeepers across New South Wales. Um, there's community meetings. I've been to a couple of community meetings that I can get to. Um, I've travelled up to Nana Glen and had a tour with Danny and, and Chris Anderson from New South Wales DPI um, across a large farm, which I've got some images of tomorrow's presentation and worked through some issues that the industry was going to have with the reimbursement potential for um, blue, uh, rubus growers in the Nana Glen region. So we worked through in the lead up to that visit, um, had a meeting with beekeepers and growers in Nana Glen and subsequently still lots of things happening in the Nana Glen space. They've had a one-way ticket to put bees into the red zone um, in order to reduce the ORC claims from the rubus crops, which would have cost our industry in the end in the cost of response. So there's some things. Yeah. Um, I hope that sort of answered it. There's, yeah, so you can tell me what I do. Yeah. And, and while you do add to it, Danny, just, just sort of expand a bit on the um, the one-way move of hives into Nana Glen, why that is and, and what's happening. Yeah, the, I was just going to expand on, I think both Bianca and I have not only become fluent in um, acronyms in this response, including RAs or, or RRAs, which are rapid or, ra or rapid risk assessments. Um, and I suppose I just want to make the point that if we didn't have someone like Bianca um, in the response, the response would look completely different. The amount of stuff that, whilst the people working in the response are experts in biosecurity and running responses, they're not beekeepers um, and they really don't understand beekeeping on the ground. And some of the stuff that, if we weren't there to head off at the pass, um, it just wouldn't make the response function. And so it is unbelievably important that we do have some people from industry um, to have eyes over those assessments that come out, um, how the response is operating, but also to troubleshoot. Usually when the beekeepers ring Bianca is because they're not getting what they want out of the DPI and Bianca's the last resort. Um, and and having being able to have that, that person in that role as a varroa coordinator, um, I think makes the world of difference for a lot of people that are affected in the red zone and purple zones, um, but also for the industry and how the responses run, we're able to make sure that some of the stuff they do makes sense um, for beekeepers. Are you going to expand on Nana Glen? Um, no, not on Nana Glen necessarily. I was just also going to say that we've also organised um, Sugar for Bees, which you may have seen across the socials um, and our website. Um, essentially, under the emergency response, the department is um, in part responsible for providing emergency fodder. So, Arvik was lucky enough to receive a donation that helped us um, to facilitate the movement of sugar dust in bulk of bags from Sydney um, up to Newcastle area. Um, the donation of the sugar dust has been free from Sugar Australia, which is wonderful for, for, for their point of view to do that for us. Um, and the, well, Arvik has been um, looking after the transport costs, which is um, something we've done out of a donation that we've received. And we are actively, I go and visit uh, at the same time that the beekeepers come in to collect that sugar dust in the gigantic bulker bags, which I'd never seen before. That was an experience, um, climbing and tying down and getting completely covered in sugar. Um, it's quite weird stuff. So that's been really good. There's been beekeepers in the purple zones who, um, for different reasons, maybe they don't want to move their bees, maybe they're not allowed to under the a permit that wasn't approved, um, or essentially the sites they've got to move to aren't flowering and they're not producing anything. So to keep their bees going in the purple zone, which is essentially important for beekeepers, but it's also important for the response because those hives in the purple zones represent data. And without them alive, without them having surveillance going on in the second round, um, the DPI doesn't have enough data to give us confidence that they've done enough surveillance. So keeping them going with sugar syrup um, has yeah, been very good. 
we got rid of 23 bulker bags in the first round and um, I'm currently tallying and dragging people, kicking and screaming to sign up for more. Um, to, I'm about three quarters of the way there to do the next round that we'll chuck on a truck and bring to, to Summersby, which is at the central coast, for beekeepers to come and collect um, and take home and hopefully get in before it turns to concrete. Um, that's the other part. But, yeah, Danny, you can talk to the Nana Glen bits and pieces. Um, so what well, Peter's alluding to there, so Nana Glen, it's um, probably more well-known as Coffs Harbour. The Coffs Harbour produces about 70% of... Yeah, it's not on the map. Um, about 70% of the blueberries for the country uh, as a huge producer of raspberries and blackberries, um, affectionately known as rubers. Uh, that area lit up um, early in the response with a very light um, mite loading on one hive that was recently moved from Newcastle up there to do pollination. The teams treated it as everything else. They did the, the zones, uh, euthanized the red zone, commenced baiting in there, did a heap of surveillance. It's of all the zones is the most advanced in terms of they're into their second round surveillance. They've comp completed three rounds of baiting um, and they have great confidence that uh, none of the mites transferred out of those hives into anywhere else in that area. Um, but to facilitate uh, pollination of those blueberries and rubus crops, uh, we have worked on risk assessments, our favourite documents, to look at the, to be able to bring managed colonies into those zones on a one-way ticket. They're allowed in, not allowed out. But they're going into that zone to facilitate pollination. Um, and they've put rules around that to manage the risk and allow it to happen. But the reason we did that is because that if, if pollination couldn't occur in those zones or that zone at, at Coffs Harbour, it meant that there would potentially be a $40 million uh, claim um, put to the response, potentially. Um, however, the blueberries aren't signatories to the deed, uh, so they technically couldn't do it, so they were left in limbo. Um, but they're an important part of our industry, providing a lot of work for bees up in that area, and it was really important for the response to, to provide that continuity. So it took a hell of a lot of horse trading um, and convincing and endless risk assessments um, to enable it to happen, uh, but it is happening. So there's bees going into that zone, doing pollination. They're actually baiting while those bees are there, and they're able to do both concurrently um, and keep the baiting program going and it's working they're getting they're getting yield um, they're not the, gr the growers up there aren't screaming for compensation um, there are some that aren't happy but the majority of the big growers are happy um, and I think that's part of you know a good news story out of the response where despite the epi's um, objection to taking some of those risks um, the business continuity uh, for those businesses and the beekeepers up there uh, ruled uh, over the epis, which was, which was good. Everyone's comfortable that those risks are being managed and it's not compromising the response, but it is giving us a reasonably good outcome. And, and I'd just like to add on to that as well, that uh, in terms of that, pollination is good for the pollination-dependent industries, the ones that need us, but it's good for us too. It's, it's, it's money. So it's, it's a cooperative relationship. And pollination we've used as a honeybee industry as a reason for why we need to be looked after, why Victoria has got a great system in terms of public land bee sites. And you know, so, so it's justification. justification. But we're saying how important we are for pollination and so you should be looking after us. In the end, we've got a responsibility as well to still service that pollination. Even though those bees are on a one-way ticket, do the job and then they're, then they're killed. So it's, so it's important to note that, yeah, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, this one's for Danny, so hang on to it, mate. Uh, given the vast area of the IPs to date, um, do we have a stat on what portion of that detection is from illegal hive movement and the portion that's what we think is natural movement? And the third 
Third one's non, non-illegal movements, but still movements, right? Um, yeah, I don't know the figures off the top of my head. There's a couple of obvious ones. So the tar ring detections, which are the two dots on the top of that screen, they were illegal movements, no doubt about it. It's actually just gone to court, I think, two weeks ago, um, the, the commercial guy that moved. Um, and, and so I think it's a, a real um, demonstration about the team and the response and the ability to do tracing. It was through tracing that they caught those movements. A lot of people will come to us and say, oh, you're never going to get it. There's bees moving everywhere, right? And, but when you ask them, well, who's moving? Or where did you see that? Or when did that happen? The details are very scant. So there's a lot of rumours of movements. But we know the level of tracing that's happening, they are picking it up. I don't know what percentage that is. Um, but they are finding it through that in-depth. And I'd... And I'm not allowed to show it, but I'd love to be able to show you the, the tracing maps that they do. They're, they're, there's a couple of versions. There's the network map, um, which looks like a cobweb, but you can zoom into it and you can actually see every movement of every IP and where it came from and how it got there based on the um, tracing data. The other one is, is a demonstration of, of just how connected they are in a little animation, um, but it, you know, confidentiality and all that, I'm not allowed to show that. Um, but what we do know, all the IPs are explained. There's no, unexpl apart from the new ones, which they're working on, uh, there's no IPs that are unexplained. Now, some of those are natural spread, but the ones they're saying are natural spread are the ones that are deep in the red, where we know the mite loadings are high, we know there's still feral bees there. The, Ones that are really important that put the response at risk around the edges have been movements and not all illegal. They've been allowed to move bees in the purple zone for business continuity and they've inadvertently picked up mites when they've moved and, and the tracing has picked that up and then they've been able to go back to where they came from and, and do all the searching around it as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of people sort of get the impression that, you know, there's a whole heap of illegal movement going on and there's things all for a waste of time because of that. Um, I'm not that sure that it is as bad as what some people are making it out to be. Yeah, well, that's right. If you if you get caught moving uh, and prosecuted, it's a $1.1 million fine. And if you're a commercial entity, it's $2.2 million um, for illegal movements in breach of that, that order. Um, so it's it's not something to sneeze at either. And police are actively out there now looking, um, and that's only happened in the last three or four months, but they are actively looking for movements and pulling beekeepers over. And if they haven't got the declaration or can't show them the electronic declaration or movement permit, then big questions get asked very quickly. Ken, uh, Brom? You just said that all the IPs are known entities. Do you mean the first one is a known entity? Um, when, when I say known entity, so they, 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 they know how it got there. So basically there's only two reasons. It's natural spread or it's been a movement. IP1. Yeah. Do we know how, how it got how it arrived in this country? Um, yeah, and I, there's a couple of questions I'm surprised we haven't been asked, and that's one of them. Um, how did it get here? Because uh, that's normally the first question we get asked on panels. Uh, <laughs> um, the short answer is no, we don't know. The long answer is uh, in the response, they have been collecting the mites as they go around in the response, and they've been doing, doing genetic testing on them. Part of that is a standard procedure to ensure that the new IP is not a new incursion, that it's part of the same incursion, right? So that's standard procedure. In doing that genomic work, they're also looking at um, likeness, relationships between those IPs. And they can actually tell and trace back to where IP1 was, right? Because based on the surveillance, we don't actually know. They found it at the Port and Surveillance Hive and then found more inland, so they didn't actually know where IP1 was. Um, with the likeness stuff, uh, likeness work they've been doing, they are able to narrow it down to where the first you know, population started to breed from and move out from, right? And it's in, in the heart of the Newcastle area. 
Um, in terms of how did it get there, um, where it came from, is usually what I get asked, where's the origin? Um, they're doing the genomics work, but they have really struggled with it. I think they're up to iteration about number seven or eight now, attempted genomic sequencing of the mites. In fact, it's become that hard to try and pinpoint it. Um, some of the sequencing now has been done in South Korea because they've got much better genomic um, database of the mites. Uh, but what they do know is they've been able to rule out countries where we know it hasn't come from. Um, so we know it didn't come from New Zealand um, until, well, you just told me before you brought a couple over with you, <laughs> just a couple. Um, it didn't come from New Zealand. Um, we also know it didn't come from the Southeast Asia region. Um, what it looks like, the region that it is coming from, is the Americas, right? And at the moment, it's still shooting a data to DARPA, but they're thinking from the North America region. But that doesn't really make sense, right? We know it doesn't have deformed wing virus. They have done heaps of virus testing on the samples they've got. It doesn't have deformed ring virus. We know they've done resistance testing on the mites. So the standard testing protocols, what they call the PETIS test, right? So they've done that for Bavarol and for Amitraz. And Bavarol is normally the first one that will fall over, but it's not resistant to Bavarol. It's getting good kills with Bavarol. And Bavarol resistance is widespread across America and, and Canada. So there's a couple of things that don't quite add up there, right? So they're still working to try and pinpoint it. Um, but they are promising they will get there. We'll just go over. It's about, is it 10K? Yeah, 12, about 10, 15K inland. Unlikely. Unlikely, unlikely to be off a boat. The port of Newcastle is a bulk handling port. It will be a, sh a, sh a sea shipping container port, but at the moment it's a bulk handling port. The likelihood of uh, incursion coming on a bulk handling port is, is low. We don't typically see new detections on bulk handling ships. Typically they come in on shipping containers or plant and equipment that comes in. Um, and so... Where, where that ground zero is though, there is a big industrial area that does bring machinery in, there is a commercial airport, there is a RAF base, um, and there's a bunch of commercial beekeepers in that area. So, you know, there's, there's multiple possibilities of how it came in. Sort of half answered your question, Mark. I was just going to say it's lucky it was 12 kilometres from the port of Newcastle and go the National Bee Pest Surveillance Program for picking it up. <laughs> Any more questions? Just, just following on from the um, tracing of the genetics, do you also trace the genetics of bees or queens, like from the initial findings? Yes. Um, so in those initial ones, uh, yes, the queens were taken out of some of those operations, um, particularly the queen breeders in those zones. They're still in the freezer um, somewhere, I've been told. Uh, they have been taking samples, and a lot of samples, both of the mites, the bees, have all been going to different labs. So none of this is done in one lab, right? So it's, it's been pushed out across multiple labs, uh, particularly across the eastern seaboard, um, to make sure that they are getting as much information out of it as they can, um, and particularly around the viruses. So they're doing that in... Most of it's been done by John Roberts at CSIRO, his lab. Um, and so not a lot of that virus work... Um, or even the DNA genomics work has been done inside New South Wales DPI labs that have been outsourced. But there are heaps of samples being kept and there are more researchers coming in. They're starting to get really interested and starting to say, well, you know, this is a prime opportunity to do some work as well. So we're starting to see researchers, now that it's calmed down a bit, starting to stick the nose in there and say, well, hey, can I start grabbing samples to do X, Y and Z as part of R&D as well? So. The, It'll be interesting over the next few years to see that information come out and what the learnings are.
So I'm, I'm wondering if this is one of the ones that you get asked a lot. Um, I may have missed it, I'm not sure. But do you have any sort of clear indicators of how long the mite has actually been here before it was detected? So you're saying that you can't pick up things like resistance to, you know, miticides or whatever. If it had been here for a hell of a long time, um, it hadn't been treated for a long time, potentially it could have lost that. I don't know, I don't know how it all works, but mm. is, there any, is there any sort of clear evidence to point out how, how long it's actually been on our shores before we found it? Well, this is a the technical specialist that isn't getting an answer in that one. So the, the standard line from the DPI is 18 to 24 months. The short answer is don't know. Um, what I've been seeing in this response and talking to people like Dennis Anderson and Michelle Taylor and a lot of these international experts that can look at the mite population densities and hives and then model out how long they think it's been here based on those densities. Um, it doesn't match up to what they know. So the problem, because we don't have to form wing virus, we know the hives can hold much higher mite loadings before they collapse, right? With the form wing virus, the, the mites don't build up as high levels before the hive collapses. I wonder, and it's purely just my speculation, but I'm wondering whether this particular mite is breeding quicker than what we're seeing in other countries where they're continually treated. So we know this doesn't have resistance, right? So it's potentially come from somewhere where it's not getting a lot of treatment on it, right? And there are areas with Africanised genes, for example, that get away without doing a lot of treatments. So it is potential that if it doesn't have, and this is just purely my postulating over it, if it doesn't have resistance, it might have come from an area they're not treating a lot, it might have evolved in a short period of time to break quicker than what it is doing in countries like New Zealand or the US, um, which, it's that example that's given them the 18 to 24 month period. If it's pretty quicker, it means it could have been here shorter. And that would explain why we've, we've found it in just a, such a tight area, right? If it's been here truly for two years, we know highs in that Newcastle area has been at Almonds in Victoria quite a few times, right? So if it's truly been here for two years and we've had those bees with the mites moving all over the country, why aren't we picking it up everywhere? It should be exploding across the blue zone. So again, it doesn't quite add up and there's something else going on. Um, and that's why I think a few of these researchers are going, oh, well, there might be some exciting stuff we could put in a paper and get our name on and, and, and do some work around. So, anything like that? I was just going to add that um, one of the initial traceback surveillance events that we did was a link to one of the very heavily infested beekeepers in the Newcastle zone that had been in Victoria 12 months um, earlier and we didn't find any um, any varroa in any of the close contacts in Victoria there which would suggest that they didn't have it 12 months prior and they were one of the you know one of the very very heavily infested people up there so you'd think 12 months later if there'd been any transmission in Victoria would have picked it up really quickly but there was nothing so which was comforting. <laughs> We're struggling for questions. You, you've got away pretty lightly tonight, yeah. Pete. So, yeah. I've, got, I've got a question for you, Pete. Uh, so, Pete, um, you asked Bianca to explain her experiences. Um, you came up to the IMZ, up to Orange, the, the beautiful and cold, cold, cold Orange. Um, and I think it might have even snowed while you were there. Uh, and spent a week up there. Um, do you want to describe what your thoughts were about the chaos or the organised chaos of the control centre? So, so I can't, it was um, in July. Was it? Still cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was pretty sure it was July. It was before almonds. Um, and I went up there and, and spent a week with Danny um, in, the, in the main control, the state control centre in, based in Orange, as he said. Um, Danny described it as Chaos, yes, it was chaos, but um, as, and Danny was the only um, person from our industry there, um, apart from the the industry people that we that we like to say we own, but but they're actually part of the New South Wales DPI. They they sort of be people, but they work for the government, um, New South Wales government. They were there too and on our side. 
but it was bedlam. And as Danny had sort of indicated, there's a hell of a lot of people there. It was a massive control room, um, big TV screen, same as this sort of thing you see on um, uh, big fire responses, um, big emergency responses going on. Big, big TV screens everywhere with all the results of all the all the checking that's all the teams going out and and, and doing sampling of hives and results coming in and getting updated multiple times in the day. So so that was constantly in front of you. Um, we had everyone running around and, and lots of biosecurity experts coming up with all these plans. This is how we're going to control it. Um, and then and, and before I got there it was only just Danny and. Um, and so I'd like to think I, I sort of tried to come in and, um, and take some of the mundane stuff off him while I came up to speed for a couple of days um, and gave him someone to, to vent to, but, but also and we could talk through different issues while we then tried to grab hold of this plan that had been developed and this is what we're going to do to, to save Australia from Varroa and, and then we just had to put some actual beekeeping sense into it. Um, and, and say that will not work, and uh, or, or you've got to approach it this way, or this is the media response that's going out to beekeepers, and then we had the same as Bianca's doing right now. You had to do things like you say, beekeepers will not understand that, or they will read that this way. So we had to reinterpret it and provide some words so that so that we could understand it. Um, it was constant. It was um, uh, starting at about eight o'clock, uh, went through to about six o'clock. Um, then we went and um, and then we had uh, every night of the week we uh, got back, got on a Zoom meeting, or not, no, it wasn't every night of the week, it was a regular time during that week, um, having a Zoom meeting with uh, the um, members of ARBIC and, and other key personnel um, so that we could update them as to what was actually going on. But it, it was actually very crazy, um, long days, um, not, not just by the people in the control room, but but in saying that it was um, bedlam and chaos, it was also um, inspiring. Uh, there was a lot of people there all working for us, and, uh, and that was really good. Um, yeah. Anyway. It, it, it ties me up as well, Pete, don't worry. Um, but yes, it was chaos, but what, what's interesting is the whole response and all responses, five, fires, floods, etc., all work under an AIM structure, right? I'd so say everyone there has a coloured tabard, and, and I was really hopeless because they changed change over so quickly to remember people's names, is um, people would say, Danny, we need to get this done, I want to do that, and I'd go, yellow tabard. You go, go, go to the yellow one, go to the green one, chase down the green guy. Um, and, and that's how it, it worked, and then everyone underneath those coloured tabards all have a job. They all have a very specific job to do, and, and yes, Chaos, but organised chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in saying before Danny got me onto that, and I was just about to say we've been here over two hours now, and, and we've um, so I'm giving you a last call on questions. So so think about it while I talk a bit. Um, over two hours, we've got a whole bunch of people here that are that are overworked and underpaid um, for what they do. So um, unless you sort of come up with some more questions pretty quick, I'm going to close this down. But we'll go to a question for you, Danny. If you could just sort of explain in terms of the whole response over 12 months, um, what what is the process that that um, both you and Tim from the Army Board have been working with in terms of there's not just um, a big bucket of money that is constantly getting dipped into. How has that process worked and, and what sort of decision points have been along the way so far and what's to come? Yeah, so the question around cost, which is the second most commonly asked question um, of beekeepers. So the 26 parties that make the decision around this uh, response, the, the technical group, the CCPP, they, they look at the response plan, they make a recommendation to the national management group whether that response plan is technically sound and going to achieve its goal. Then the horse trading starts about how we're going to pay for it. So we agreed early on in response plan version one, which was the first 100 days of the response on a budget. The budget, and, and I can't remember, Tim, I think it was 35 million at that point um, for the first 100 days. Uh, they got to the end of 100 days and they hadn't spent anywhere near that, not even half. In fact, they didn't even know how much they'd spent, um, which frustrated Tim to no end, don't worry, because he went them a few times over it. 
Um, and so they just kept kicking that can down the road. So we went for 100 days on that approved budget. That blew out to December on the same budget. And then I think it went up a little bit in December through to the end of um, June. We, we operated on a, on a similar budget right through. And then just last week, uh, the response plan version three, which will actually see the response plan through to the end, which is mid-2026, um, was approved. It's yet to be completely signed off, but it was agreed to by all, all the parties. Um, and that was some horse trading, right? Like We ended up having to broker a deal um, to get that across the line. And that involved um, the retrospectivity of Category 2, so making Category 2 apply to the start of the response. Um, but also, in the other part of the deal was to make sure the industries were going to stay in the response, right? So, industries are sitting there saying, nah, look, if you don't get, if you don't get retrospectivity, we're out, we're done, it's too expensive, we're done. Governments are saying, well, we're not going to give you, we're not going to give you retrospectivity just so you can jump out. So, we're not paying you to leave, right? Reducing your bill and then you're out. So there was this real balance of trying to appease all the parties. And where it ended up doing um, just last week, it came to the culmination of, of the deal being all the industry parties agreeing to stay in, which allowed then the government parties to agree to retrospectivity back to the start of the response, um, which is where we got the agreement moving forward. Um, now, what does that do? So the whole response is, um, but for the industry parties, based on a percentage on what we pay. The percentage of what we pay is based on uh, a calculation of your local value of production, so the, the value of the product we produce as an industry, multiplied by the pollination dependency of your industry. Obviously, honeybees is 100%. Um, but a lot of the industries had pre-determined um, dependencies, and early on in the response, every industry argued the piss about, no, they didn't rely on bees as much as that. So it was a race to the bottom. It ended up actually not changing it, the, the percentages because everyone tried to drop their dependency. Um, but what that means is, in this response, we are not paying the most of everyone. In fact, um, and Tim, you're going to have to shout out, I think it's almonds are the biggest contributors, or is it grains? Almonds, apples, grains, um, Who's the other big one? There's another, sorry? Cherries. Cherries are all paid more than we are in this response on a percentage basis. So our, our percentage with category two, uh, based on that formula, is 1.11% of, of the overall cost. Um, and so that's really important to note that when we were in Animal Health Australia, um, we were sitting there, Lindsay alluded to it earlier, sitting there as, as a Category 3, and we had no friends in animal health. It turned out in Animal Health Australia, there was not too many industries that relied on honeybees for their income. So um, thankfully, uh, our forefathers that were running the show at the time, um, I think it was before Pete's time even, uh, they looked at that and thought, oh, if, if, if the proverbial really hit the fan here, we, we, we're on our own. Uh, and so they made the decision to go across to Plant Health Australia, uh, which was an ordeal. It was an ordeal. We were part of both camps for a little while. Uh, but once we eventually transitioned across to Plant Health Australia, all of a sudden we had all these friends, right? In fact, for this response, we've got 16 friends in there to share the cost with. So without having that system, there's no way we'd be embarking on this. Um, now, in terms of the, the, the total cost of what's going to come out of our pocket as beekeepers, we don't know. We do not know yet. We've got a budget agreed to in this response plan version three. It's still, because it's not signed off about yet, we're actually not allowed to talk about it yet. What we are doing just this week and hopefully next week we finalise it is talking points. We'll give us some infographics about just how much everyone is paying um, in this that we can distribute to industry to try and answer those questions. Um, but it is a really um, frustrating thing that we're not allowed to be as open and transparent as we would like to be about it. Um, but it's not tens of millions of dollars, right? So this is something we think that if we were to raise our levies by perhaps a cent a kilo, up to 5.6 cents, it's something we can easily pay off well and truly within the next decade. Um, so we are not sinking the industry into a huge amount of debt that we're going to be paying off for generations. We are being um, 
responsible about it and ensuring, and, and so are all the industries, because this is at the forefront of every industry's mind, is we don't want a legacy left behind for the industries to pay off for decades. Um, so it is something that we'll, we'll, we will be talking about in the coming weeks, but we can't talk about it right now. So, fair warning for you. Any last questions? I've got one more. One more, last one, very last one. So I'll put that to, we've had discussion, we've had Steve talking to us about Arbic, um, we've had Danny and, and Bianca talking to us about Arbic today. Arbic um, survives on a funding and through their program of Friends of Arbic. Um, Danny or Bianca, how do Friends of Arbic become into, come into being? How do they donate money to Arbic to actually fund the operation? Um, so, interestingly, our Friends of Arctic, despite all the hard work we've been doing, has not moved during this response. We are achieving the same amount of Friends of Arctic now as what we were more than 12 months ago, which I find a little bit dis disheartened and disconcerting um, because, like Pete said, our primary source of income is donations from beakers. We get nothing out of the levies, right? We, we oversee the levies as, and they're spent on biosecurity surveillance. We get nothing out of it. So it does worry me um, for the sustainability of the organisation that if something like Varroa is here and we're not seeing beekeepers get behind the beaker organisation, um, what is the future of that organisation? So it is tough. Um, but to try and make it, and we know there's issues around it, we know that um, the system to donate is, is not getting reminders, it's very manual. So the anchor we had to talk about all the work she's been doing around automating the process. I was lucky enough to um, really quickly learn how to work the website, um, which I regret uh, every day. Uh, so our Friends of Arbic can be found on our um, website, which is honeybee.org.au. You can go through to the links of Become a Friend. Um, it's all automated online, so if you choose to put your credit card details in, all of the prompts are there for you. If you choose to um, put a larger amount, which I recommend, um, you can automatically transfer through when our bank account details are in that um, the same form online. Um, that's about it. You Now your reminders will keep hitting you um, in your mailbox. Um, to make sure you don't forget to be our friend. And my role's not part of the Friends of Arbic funding either. My role has been funded by the Department of the Federal Department of um, Ag, Forestry and Fisheries as well. So but yeah, it is it is a bit difficult to understand how um, the profile of Arbic's probably never been bigger and yet the, the Friends, Friends of Arbic, Arbic hasn't, hasn't really seen um, the, the same, same love. And, um, and while you are funded by the Federal Department at the moment, um, it's, it's been very apparent that, um, that we will need you to continue. So we've got to ensure Sorry. through an increased Friends of Arbic, encourage every single one of you to go to the website and become a friend of Arbic so we can continue the, the good work and, um, and keep the anchor on. And um, yeah, it's, they're the ones that are protecting us. They're the ones that are actually managing this on our behalf. And so that is keeping Victoria Varroa free. It's a simple equation. Um, I'm going to finish there. I'd like to very much thank all our five panellists. Um, come up to them, shake their hand at least, pat on the back, say thank you over the next day or tonight. Keep them up, shout them beers tonight, um, yeah, and, and then see how they perform if they've got to speak tomorrow. But put your hands together and thank our five panellists here. Sell it. Profit. We've got a few gifts and uh, please excuse us while I hand out some gifts.